getting ready to start now. If everybody wants to find a seat, there are plenty of seats on this side. Hello, it's good to see you. Um, thank you for being part of the live, or being all of the live audience for a special program that we're taping today for the Connecticut Network, CTN. This will be airing throughout the month to celebrate Women's History Month, and I'm really glad to have you here. So let me start by saying, uh, from Ella Grasso, the first woman in the U.S. to be elected governor in her own right, to Denise Napier, the first African-American woman in the nation, elected state treasurer, Connecticut does have a proud tradition of women serving in government. But while women make up more than half the population of the state, less than one-third of the legislators in the Connecticut House of Representatives are women, and only one-quarter of the Connecticut Senate is female. At the federal level, the numbers are even more dismal. What's holding women back from holding office? How can we get more women to run? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today, and we have several people joining us to give us their thoughts. Now, Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman is going to be joining us. She, uh, as is typical with women who have a uh, busy political life, she's going to be delayed a little bit. So we may do this a little bit out of order so that we can accommodate the Lieutenant Governor when she gets here. But she is uh, on her way and will join us in a little while. So our first guest today Today is Patty Russo, and Patty is the president of the Women's Campaign School at Yale. The Women's Campaign School is a nonpartisan, issue neutral political campaign training program. For over 20 years, Patty has been focused on improving the quality of life for women in Connecticut and all over the U.S. She has held numerous leadership positions in public, private, and not for profit sector arenas centered on women's rights. She has also held leadership positions in federal, state, and local political campaigns. Campaigns. She's vice president of the board of the Foundation for Connecticut Women and the Advisory Council for Women's Health Research at Yale. Patty is also a commissioner emerita for the Connecticut Permanent Commission on the Status of Women. And uh, just to give you an idea about some of her political inspiration, while Patricia was an undergraduate, she served as an intern to the late Congresswoman Bella Abzug. Uh, at the campaign school, she has taught courses like making the decision to run and effective fundraising techniques. Patty's joining us now to tell us more about the Women's Campaign School at Yale and how they seek to create what she calls a culture of running. Patty. Thank you, Diane. Fabulous as always. She is such a great girlfriend to the campaign school. She's also in full disclosure here, she's also a former member of our board, so we know star quality when we see it, and I'm so glad that Thank CTN you. knows star quality as Thank well. You. And CTN has also been fabulous about coming to our school every year to, uh, to videotape some of our faculty and to see us in action. And I can't tell you, Diane, how many folks have said to me, I've, I saw you on CTN, and it, I couldn't sleep. I saw you in CTN at 3 a.m., and, you know, I was, you know, I was home waiting on a conference call at 11 o'clock and I just turned on the TV and, and the campaign school was there. So um, thanks to great connections like Diane, great, uh, you know, we're, one of the things that I like to say is, you know, we're also involved here in Connecticut overall and in, in addition to being involved with the campaign school of creating a new old girls network, you know, men are so great at it and we are not so great at it, but we're getting better at it because of star girlfriends like Diane. So thank, thank you. you so much. I'm a prop speaker. Here is our new brochure from the campaign school. As, uh, as I am mentioned to you, uh, we are a issue neutral uh, school. And we are truly bipartisan. Uh, half of our board are Republicans and half are Democrats. It makes for a very interesting conversation, as you can imagine. I like to say that we are role models for Congress because we truly do get along. We're very respectful of each other. And even though we don't agree on every issue, and Teresa Younger is also here, uh, Executive Director of, of our, P our Commission on the Status of Women, but also a member of, of the board of the campaign school, she will attest, she just spent the weekend at my home at a board retreat, that we truly, we truly get along and we, we um, are, are, you know, really 
really work hard towards the common goal of getting more women to run. Uh, and um, either on the Democratic side or the Republican side, we are both committed to that, to that goal. Uh, much of the work that I do on behalf of the school's president is I do a lot of speaking. So I, I um, help spread the word on the importance of the school. Two of our star can graduates of the school are here, and you'll be hearing from them uh, shortly. And I think that they, they are, you will find them inspirational, and um, they will share with you their personal experience at the school and how it has transformed their lives. Why aren't women running? Well, first of all, here we are March, and as I like to say, you know, they give us one month a year, women's month, one month, a year. let's make the most of it, and I do. I'm here today. <laughs> I'm at Women's Day tomorrow at PCSW, so join us at the Capitol for a, just a terrific day tomorrow. But they give us one month a year, so let's, you know, let's dazzle them. And we're still talking about power. And when are we just going to have power so that we don't have to, to talk about it? Uh, I just want to talk a few minutes about the genesis of the school. Back in 1992, before many of you were born, there was a group of us that were working very hard. It was the year of the woman. Remember that year? We were so busy raising money for just a variety of, uh, of uh, women running for the House and the Senate nationally. And of course, they all come to Connecticut because everyone knows that's where you raise the big bucks. And it was just such an exciting time. And I remember feeling in that moment that we had leveled the playing field and that, that it was going to be very different for women running and that we were going to reach parity in 1992. Well, we did have a banner year. But by 1993, it was, it was back to the way it had been. It was as if 1992 was an aberration. It was as if that year had never happened because we saw an increase in the number of white men uh, running, and we had no idea where our women had gone. And so a group, a uh, bipartisan group of women in Connecticut, led by our founder, Andre Brooks of Westport, met with Rosa DeLauro, our congresswoman, from the New Haven area, who is also our lone congresswoman <laughs> in, um, in Connecticut, but she's mighty. And as all of you know, she, she is um, extremely outspoken, and the men really listen to her when she speaks. And um, con former Congresswoman Nancy Johnson, a Republican member of Congress who you may remember from um, the, the New Britain area. And they all sat down and they said, you know, maybe what we need is a campaign school for women. You know, maybe we need a place for women to come and just be together and talk about what it's going to take to run. And, um, and so they went, marched over to Yale Law School and found a, uh, found a great friend in the dean at Yale Law School. And the rest is our history. We have been in existence now for 18 years. Our program this summer is June 11th to June 15th. Our program is a two-pronged approach. We uh, do campaign training uh, for women who are interested in running for public office, but we also do campaign management training. So you know all those campaigns that you're working on and it's all men, and you're like, where are the women? Well, we're training women to become campaign managers and finance directors and you know key leadership and, uh, for campaign management. So it's a two-pronged approach. The other thing that's really special and wonderful about our program is that we have 25 percent of our of our student population are from other countries so we have an international component last year we had a woman from Cameroon who was running for president Kawala the woman was amazing but was detained because she had been kidnapped two days prior to her coming to Yale by her opponents these, we have our challenges here in our country, but these are just never issues that are on our plate that we have to even think about. Can, so can you imagine the obstacles and the barriers that our international sisters face when they choose to run? And so I think that the program is, is unique and special in that it brings together national women, two of whom you'll hear from today, and an international women, and you'll see that and hear that 
we're, we really have so much in common, and we really do create this international community of women, uh, which continues, again, thanks to social media, making it so easy to, to uh, connect with uh, women of the world, uh, staying in touch with um, our sister graduates in, in other countries. So what happened? Why aren't women running? I have my own ideas about why women aren't running. I think our culture, in terms of how a woman comes to decide to run, is very different from a man. A man gets up, takes a shower, gets dressed, looks in the mirror. I'm running for Senate today. <laughs> a little different for women. <laughs> women get up, they look around. There's got to be somebody out there who wants to run. Not me, but there's got to be somebody else out there. Where are the nurturers in our society? And that's a good thing. Hey, I'm an Italian mom and proud, okay? I think that we bring um, such a texture and richness to our society, and I want to share that in leadership in Congress and in the State House. And so we come from it from a very different perspective. Men see it as an opportunity for them to grow their business, to, uh, you know, to help them professionally. Women do not. They just don't see it that way. Our route is very different. We want to help. We want to make our community better. We want to make our country better. Uh, we're mad about something. We want to change and improve things for our children. So that's a very different perspective. Um, oftentimes women say, well, I would have run, but no one asked me. And my whole thing is, ladies, this is not the prom. This is public service. Please look in the mirror and say, it's my time. Men make their time. Women never seem to find the time for themselves. I mean, you know, we all kind of juggle a million things and we all don't get enough rest and we're all living in our cars, running around, trying to do all this great stuff that we love to do. And men are just very focused on themselves and what kinds of things are going to promote. I see faces, not to slam the, the couple of guys. I, I love men. I'm married to one. They're fabulous. Um, but it's just a very different path. I mean, the joke when my daughter was younger and I was traveling quite a bit for the PCSW was I had I would um, just anticipate everything that may happen while I was away for two days. I mean, insane, but we've all been there. Just di dinners and uh, sheets on the beds and towels and just so that all he had to do was focus on our daughter and did a great job of focusing on our daughter. Whereas, you know, my husband gets up and takes off and doesn't even occur to him that we have a six month old or you know, however she, old she was at the time. So it's just a very different perspective. So now we just are busy, you know, happily creating this culture of just saying to women, why don't you run? Why don't you think about running? Just planting the seed. Six years ago when our daughter went off to college, I went back to college myself. <laughs> Um, a couple of months prior, I had done a one-day training at Yale with my girlfriend, State Senator Tony Boucher. I like to always partner with a Republican girlfriend, just, just so you know, I'm a Democrat. Surprise. Uh, but she's a Republican, and we're also Italian, so we talk the same way. And again, I think it's really good role modeling. So we're doing a program. We have about 50 women in the class and two men. And have any of you seen the um, movie Election with Reese Witherspoon? It's an oldie, but a goodie. It's really, really a great movie. The two guys in the front seats reminded me so much of Reese. I'd ask a question, their hands would go up. Uh, that basically sucking all the air out of the room. And all of a sudden, because <laughs> you know how that goes when it's not a single sex situation. All of a sudden, I see my women fading into the beautiful walls at Yale Law School. And they're checking their hair and their makeup, things they really, quite frankly, never do when it's, it's you know, just us. And I was so intrigued that these two young men had found us that I just said to, t to Tony at the break, I said, uh, she's like, what's up with those guys? What are they 
doing here? I said, inquiring minds want to know. How come young men can find us? Where are our young women? Let's, let's find out. So we interviewed them after the break. And we said, we think it's so great that you're here. What are you doing here? And they said, well, you know, I just graduated from Dartmouth. I just graduated from Stanford. We're best friends. We're interested in a career in public service. We know eventually we want to run for public office. We're making a plan for ourselves professionally. We did our due diligence. We went online. We looked at all campaign schools. And quite frankly, yours is the most comprehensive. It's the most well-priced. And it's at Yale. So bingo. So, I, so that's really what inspired me to pack my bags and say, I've got to get out and find my young women and get them thinking about a career in politics. So that's what I did. I wrote a letter to about 20 women's colleges and universities in the country and said, have I got a program for you? We will come. We will dazzle your senior uh, women and, and talk to them about thinking about, at some point in their lives, about public service and the importance of that. And quite a few, uh, I heard back from quite a few schools, and we just went out and just start, started talking to, to young women about just thinking about running or get, being involved politically. Of course, four years ago, it was really a, a lot easier because of the phenomenon of the Obama campaign. I mean, just Democrat or Republican, I think, can all agree. Even my daughter, who's the most apolitical person that I know, was just, Mom, I've got to take time off from school. I'm registering voters on the weekends, which was music to my ears. And I was thrilled that, uh, that she was, um, she was uh, politically involved, finally. And uh, was getting, she was getting uh, text messages from the campaign, and where's my ballot, mom? What's going on? You know, and, uh, and so it was really, really exciting. And then again, much like 92, and then o Obama got elected, and she's like, OK. My work is done. So then I had a pizza party at my, my house, because again, being Italian, it's all about the food. If you feed them, they will come. So I had 20 of her friends who had taken time off from school because they thought this was so important. And I said, now what? You know, what's your next campaign? Oh, none. We're done. We're, so there, was, <laughs> there were no coattails. They had no interest in this, the United States Senate, Congress. There was just a snooze compared to electing a president. And so I, find, I found it a challenge. Um, I don't want to say I found it depressing, but I was a little uh, depressed at that time after that lunch because I just thought, wow, you know, what are we going to do to continue to spark and inspire young people, not only uh, young women, but young people to continue to get engaged, especially since they had had such a wonderful experience. They were really, really excited about being a part. Uh, one of the programs that we uh, are doing now, thanks to funding from the New Haven um, Women and Girls Fund, is a young women's leadership program that we've partnered with the PCSW to do. And that is just a very focused targeted approach to, again, continuing to plant seeds and to inspire young women to help help them make their time, find their time. So my, my challenge and clarion call to all of you is to think about running your, yourself. It's never too late. That's the wonderful thing as well about women. We're really, really terrific about transforming ourselves. We've had young, uh, young, we've had young women in their 50s uh, who have come, who've taken, um, who are finished with their professional career and are ready for another career and are running for public office. Uh, we've had women who are in their 70s who have always wanted to run. And we had a woman two years ago, 71 years old, who said, it's just, please take me. I know I'm old, but please take me. It's always been my dream. And she came, and she ran, and she won. That's great. So that's my fairy tale ending to, a, uh, uh, to, our, to, our, to our work at the school. So again, thank you, Diane. We're my thrilled pleasure. to be here, and um, look forward to asking, answering your questions. My pleasure. Well, while Patty gets uh, Mike to join, the, join us on the stage here, I'd like to have our panelists come on up and take seats. I'll save this seat for Patty, and then the rest of you can sit wherever you like. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation with not only two of the graduates of the Women's Campaign School at Yale, but we hope to be joined 
by Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman, who's going to talk about how she got her start in politics, which may sound very familiar to a lot of the people in this audience, because she started for a reason that was very close to her heart. And I think it's the way that a lot of women do get engaged, is something really close to them, um, frequently at the family level, is what gets them geared up to run for office. So she'll be joining us at some point as well. But let me introduce uh, some of my other guests here. Um, I'll start, uh, actually, I'm going to skip to the middle. The woman uh, sitting in the middle with the um, tweed jacket on is, uh, I should say, a good friend to many of us here and someone that I'd like you to meet if you haven't. Um, and if you also haven't, you need to see the exhibit that she brought here. This is Catherine Wiltshire. She's the executive director of the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. And uh, if you haven't had a chance before today's talk, uh, I hope that you will take a few minutes after today's talk or throughout the rest of the month until the 23rd, actually, of going into the treasurer's and governor's offices, which are right across the hall on this floor, to see an exhibit from the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, which is called We Fight for Roses Too. And uh, Catherine has a career in corporate banking. Uh, she's been a senior manager in sales and financial marketing, but uh, a few years ago she decided she was more interested in the not-for-profit sector, worked at the Community Foundation of Fairfield County, and eventually joined the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame in September uh, 2005 and has done some fabulous things with the hall since then. Also joining us today on the panel are two of the graduates uh, from the Women's Campaign School, as promised. Gail Weinstein is sitting right next to Patty Russo. Gail is the first Selectman of Weston, and Kelly Luxemburg is at the end of the panel, and she serves on the Manchester Board of Education and has already worked for two different Congress people, so we'll find out a little bit about that. Um, Catherine, since I started by giving you uh, some prime billing on the exhibit, <laughs> thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Hall of Fame, because only a portion of it is about politics and about government, but what the entire mission about really is inspiring women to move ahead and do things that maybe they didn't think they could do. Absolutely. Our mission is to honor Connecticut women of achievement, preserve their stories, educate the public, and inspire the continued achievement of women and girls. So we do do it across all fields of endeavor. And um, what we're trying to do is share women's stories mm -hmm. as a means to provide role models and inspire the next generation of women leaders. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, we, cer we certainly focus on young women, but we think that we're providing role models to women of all ages, because mm -hmm. we feel that all women need role models, because yeah. we all go through transition times in our lives. It's so true. So many of us here have uh, transitioned into different careers <laughs> or different focuses in our lives. Catherine, tell us a little bit about the exhibit. It's a traveling exhibit, so other organizations might be interested. They can contact you about having the exhibit at their uh, location. It travels around the state and frequently goes to high schools or middle schools, universities, libraries, um, historical societies, mm -hmm. corporations, mm -hmm. um, anyone who might be gathering people to celebrate um, women and their stories. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they got their name, or the name of the yeah. exhibit, um, We Fight for Roses Too, um, was a banner at um, the 1912 um, Lawrence, Massachusetts textile strike, which women were very instrumental in. And um, the banner was, we fight for bread, but we fight for roses too. Very, and it was picked up and uh, um, James Oppenheimer turned it into a poem. Mm -hmm. But it certainly is a poetic way for women to express, yes, we want to be able to work, yes, we want equal wages, but we also like the finer things in life and to share the beauty of life, and yeah. as well as good work conditions. And it's interesting that it's 100 years old uh, this year. Very interesting. Let's talk to our graduates for a minute. Uh, Kelly, I'll start with you. Um, had you had an interest in politics uh, that goes way back, that makes you, made you decide to seek out uh, the campaign school? I have. I have always been interested in politics. I think that my interest sparked when Bill Clinton was running in 1992, and I was seven years old, and I was obsessed with his campaign. There was a Nick at Night like voting um, that occurred, and I just continued to call and vote for him. And so last year when he was here um, <laughs> for Governor Malloy, it was just a really amazing experience. And I got to tell him, like, you're the reason why I got so involved in politics. And 
I was literally obsessed. And you know, as I <laughs> went on through school, and I came back to Connecticut, and I worked um, at the legislative office building, and then went on to work for Congressman Larson, I was fortunate enough to work with Patty. And so she got me involved um, with the Women's Campaign School. I was able to attend as a guest the year before last for a day. And I was so blown away, and I knew that it was something that was really life changing. Like to be in an environment where it's all very strong women who own the fact that they're strong women. Like no one's trying to shy away from, for lack of a better word, their vaginas and being, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, to make light yes, of it. Like she did say that. Yes, yes I did. I did. Oh, how are you? <laughs> um, but it was just so empowering. And to be in part of that sisterhood where feminism, you don't shy away from that either. And it was the first time I left feeling that, yes, I am a feminism because, I am a feminist, excuse me, I can do whatever I want, and it was the perfect kind of environment to inspire that. I, I can't believe that you were so interested in politics that at seven years old, you were obsessed with Bill Clinton's campaign. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. Um, as you may have noticed, we have another guest who's joined us, Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman is here. Thank you so much. Um, she was going to be our opening act, but uh, because of the type of schedule that uh, political women keep, uh, she. but we appreciate the fact that you were able to come. I should tell you that uh, for those of you that are not as familiar with Nancy, although she is really the politician in the state who needs no introduction. Uh, before her years as lieutenant governor now, uh, she was the state comptroller for 16 years, a job that she probably could have held for life. Uh, she is now one of the most active lieutenant governors in recent history. As comptroller, she was known for a number of things, including implementing stricter accounting of state finances, overseeing the mod modernization of the computer system that runs the state's core financial operations, and to also, on a, a whole different tack, to improve the health care in Connecticut and the quality of it while helping to keep costs down. And she had a number of innovative programs that helped that happen. But before becoming state comptroller, Nancy served as a state rep from the 53rd district for about nine years. She was the house chairperson of the education committee. And that experience, I imagine, is serving you very well now since we're involved in a massive educational overhaul. And I would like Nancy to tell you, I mentioned before she came in, that she started her life in politics in a way that many women can relate to because it was really something very close to her heart that made her decide it's my turn and it's my time uh, to get up and speak. And so that's how Nancy has become a role model. I should also say that Nancy uh, is a past president of the Women's Campaign School at Yale. And welcome. Thank you so much for being here. No problem. We're pl proud to have you. Thank you very much. See, I, don't, I don't know how you want to do this now. That I, I'd like to have you tell a little bit of your story about how you got involved. Okay. And if you prefer to do it from there or from the uh, podium, now. whichever. Okay. Uh, you know, let me just kind of quickly talk about this. You know, and, and Diane was absolutely right. It was probably like many people, women getting involved in politics. Um, I didn't like what was going on in the local board of education. In fact. I, all I wanted to do was impeach them. <laughs> and being a Democrat, when I finally called, I, and I had no background in politics. My parents didn't talk about it. They didn't talk about politics, sex, or religion. <laughs> Those were the things you never talked about in my parents' house. And all of a sudden, I got to the point of saying, hey, I didn't like what was going on in the school district. I found out that there's a thing called a Democratic town chairman. And I called him up and I said, I'd like to speak to you. And he said, well, I was going out for a run. I said, well, go ahead. Go out for a run and uh, you can give me a call back later. And he said, uh, well, what's it all about? And I said, I'd like to impeach the Board of Education. <laughs> and he said, you mean the Republicans? And I said, no, the whole Board of Education. <laughs> And um, the next thing I knew, to be honest with you, I was going to a caucus that I had no idea about. And as I left there, my parents had been coming, they had been visiting from Florida. And my husband said, I said, well, what do you think I should do? And he said, well, one of the things you don't do is scratch your nose. Because it's like an auction. You're going to get in trouble. <laughs> and I kept my hands down. But somebody else put my name in to run for the Board of Ed. And I was sitting with this woman who was the, the uh, wife of 
this Democratic town chairman, and he, she said, don't do anything. Michael, take care of you afterwards. It'll be fine. So I sat there and said, okay. And then afterwards he said, I can't do anything about it. They voted on you. You're going to be running. He lied. He could have done something, but he didn't. But the next thing I know, I did run for the Board of Education. And I just, because you're talking about power and women, I, I just want to bring something out. There were three women that helped me get elected to the Board of Education. They were really there all the time. At that time, we painted our own signs. Uh, we had to bang them up ourselves. We had to do all that other stuff that now you have, you know, you go to the printer and they do all that stuff. Um, and I said, you know, they came out and worked with me all the time. And all of a sudden, and they worked with me because they thought they needed a, a person on the Board of Education that would listen and talk to the people. So I got elected. Two months go by, and I don't see these women at all. So I picked up the phone, and I said, where are you? And they said, well, Nancy, you're now one of them. So wait a minute. <laughs> you put me where I am, and now I'm one of them? You, get to the, you better come to those meetings. And they did. They started to come. But what I'm saying to you, too, is that if you're not going to get involved yourself, I hope that you will go and help other people get involved. So we really need you to get involved. Uh, the, when you get involved and you help other people, don't let them off the hook. Just because you got them there, make sure that they're still listening to what you're saying, because that's what's really important. There's two parts, and I, I don't want to take because I was late, and I apologize again. There's, there's a couple of points. I just, you know, the next thing I knew, of course, and, and, and Diane said it well, I, I ran for state rep because they told me I couldn't get out of it. I, I don't understand. <laughs> um, I then decided to run for controller, and they said, oh, controller, uh, you mean secretary of state? That guy will never live it down. I'll never <laughs> let him forget it, too. Because, of course, there had never been a woman controller of the state. And so I will tell you that Miles Rappaport ran the same time I did. He was running for Secretary of State. And every time we'd go someplace together, they'd say, let me introduce the next Secretary of State, Nancy Wine. And Miles would look at me. <laughs> and I said to Miles, whatever you do, uh, let me go up there because I've never seen a guy look like you that named Nancy. So I did explain it. And I did get up there by saying, I have a deeper voice than Miles, so you know I'm running for controller. <laughs> And he has sexier legs, so it's okay. You can vote for him for secretary. But, but getting to the, to the main thing about it is, is that you get involved, you realize too, and this is something I, I, I think I want to prove to everybody before I turn this over, is you can't always be popular. Leadership does not mean that you're always popular. Leadership is different than being popular. But making sure that you're leading is much better because you're now coming out and making your voice heard and it changed my whole life so i'm hoping today your voices will be heard it'll change your life you'll come into politics and get involved or or whatever you know whatever you want to do but if you speak out and really tell them what you think that's the best thing in the world and if you can always remember, for me for a, as a woman, I always believe that I never wanted to see my name on that front page of the paper that was going to embarrass my, my kids, my, my grandchildren now, and my, my husband. But I also realized that I never want to do anything wrong because, see, the next day I got to face myself in the mirror. And the older I get, it takes longer to put this makeup on. <laughs> so I got to tell you that just really get involved. And, and the, the school is, if you can, all go to the Yale School. I, I push for that because I think it's a great way. We've had a lot of wonderful women coming out, wonderful leaders coming out of that school. So I thank you and I can't wait to listen to the rest. Do you have time for one question before sure. you have to go? Sure. Okay. What, I'm, what I've always wondered about is when you did get elected to the legislature, was the atmosphere then uh, accommodating to women and has it changed? I know now you preside over the Senate, so you're very much in touch with the legislature. Do you see any differences between then and now? Yeah. I, you know what? I, I, I hope it's better than it was, but I, I was very, very lucky when I went to the legislature. I, um, uh, I had been staff at the legislature. I'm really an x-ray technician that can't practice in the state, so I had to get another job. Uh, but 
I worked in, in, uh, as a staff person in the legislature, and so I got to know some of the legislators ahead of time. So when I came in, we had a very large class of Democrats that came in. We had just taken over uh, the House again. Um, and what I was able to do is, because I had more knowledge than a lot of people, my first job was to become the vice chairman of the education committee, and which was kind of strange. And there was another young man with me that some of you might know, who also, as a freshman, got a vice chairman. His name was Joe Courtney. <laughs> it's a good class. Yeah, it was a great class. It really was. But but um, you know, I, I found that if you became an expert in your field, if you be became knowledgeable and didn't have to get up and speak on every bill that some of the men do, they speak on everything just to be heard, um, with all due respect to the gentlemen that are in the room. Uh, I see Tom in there. Uh, I won't talk about your husband's <laughs> being here today. Um, but you know what? You get the respect. And, and I think that goes on now. I think people, uh, I think that that, that power struggle in the General Assembly right now is a lot different than it was probably years and years ago. It's much more open than it was, and that's a good sign for us. Mm -hmm. But we still don't have enough women in there mm -hmm. anyway. And so as women, we already know that we had to, you know, we can lead the men and then make them think that they, they led us. But, um, uh, but it's, it's true, and you know, it, the truth part of it is you have to work together, otherwise um, you're not going to get anything done. And so, I, you know, I, for me, it was a great experience going into the legislature because I, I already knew where everything was. Mm -hmm. um, it, so I didn't need anybody's help telling me where to go, mm -hmm. which they do now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> thank well, you very much. Thank and I you. apologize. There's an MS thing I'm supposed to be in next. Well, thank you Bye. very, very much for coming. Thanks. We appreciate it. Thank you. Patty, let me throw the question to you for a minute, um, and that is, do you think that when you observe women as um, leaders in either the state government or at the federal level, do they lead differently than men do? I think so. I think so. I think we're much more collaborative. We're not completely ego-driven all the time. I mean, I think it's, it's important that you have a healthy ego no matter what you do in life. But I don't think, to Nancy's point, I don't think it's about just talking for the sake of talking. I also think that, again, I'm on the board of the Girl Scouts, so being prepared is really important. <laughs> it's important for men and women uh, in public service, but I think we tend to be over-prepared just, just to make sure that we don't embarrass ourselves or our families. Um, and uh, we just, um, again, much more collaborative mm -hmm. in our leadership style. Uh, that certainly is my personal goal. I really try to do that, and mm -hmm. I try to, to bring women up with mm -hmm. me. And when women come and make it, they come to me and say, what can I do for you? And mm -hmm. I say, you can mentor another woman. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we can do to, to keep it going. Gail, what was it that had you seek out the Women's Campaign School before you ran for first selectman of Weston? Well, I had actually run one term before that, and when you run a campaign without going to the Women's Campaign School, you really learn how much you don't know. So it becomes very way. important to yeah. get the, the proper training so that you know what you're doing, so you can put yourself out there in the light that you want to proceed. Yeah. Um, I did not grow up being involved in politics. My family was not a political, pol you know, political family. In fact, I was raised to believe that the only reason why a woman really needed a job was so that if her husband divorced her, she would be able to have a career to fall back on it. And I became involved in advocacy when my children were about two years old. We had an issue they were going to put high power lines behind our house. And I got involved in fighting, and I said, wow, this is really kind of cool. You mean I could speak up and people listen to what I say? And then I got involved in other issues, uh, such as the Coalition for Choice and the Stem Cell Coalition in the state. And I really got that sense of empowerment, which I thought was so important to bring to women. Mm -hmm. um, and then being involved in, in local uh, parent-teacher organizations, in the Veterans Affairs Committee, someone said to me, you know what, you should run for public office. It'll be just like running the PTA. <laughs> it's exactly the same. You don't have to worry about anything. It's just telling people what to do and standing there and cutting ribbons. You'd be great at it. So I said, OK. 
okay. Uh, we were having uncontested elections in our town, and I said, you know what? Even if I don't get anywhere, we really have to start standing up and speaking our mind. So after that first election, I realized how little I actually knew about, number one, the job that I was running for, and number two, what elections and campaigning was really about. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Women's Campaign School where I just got um, outstanding background, outstanding training, and I really think it's important now that we pay it forward and bring other women in so that they can get that same experience. Mm -hmm. Um, Catherine, some of the women that have run for office here have been firsts in the nation. And I guess the one that everybody thinks of first who comes to mind is Ella Grasso. First woman to run and win in her own right. Exactly. In other words, not a widow of someone who had held the seat. Um, she still stands above many others. Well, I think because she was the first governor, in, in a woman governor in the nation. But, you know, we certainly the hall is filled with a number of firsts. Mm -hmm. um, Chase Going Woodhouse was the first secretary of state in Connecticut, mm -hmm. went on to be um, in the House of Representatives. Um, just about the same time, Claire Booth Luce was really the first woman from Connecticut to um, be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. um, then certainly Ella stands out, and I think it's because she was such a beloved figure. Yeah. And, but many of these women used the Secretary of State as their um, jumping off mm -hmm. board. Barbara Canelli mm -hmm. was Secretary of State for a very long time, but when she got to um, be the, in the U.S. House of Representatives, she was the first woman to be elected the deputy um, majority whip, mm -hmm. which was very unusual for a woman mm -hmm. at that time. And then, of course, Denise Napier as mm -hmm. the first African-American woman in the nation um, to be elected state treasurer. So, I thought it was interesting that Nancy seemed to indicate that the Secretary of the State's position is kind of considered the girly position <laughs> in uh, constitutional <laughs> office, and that she wanted to clear that she was not running for Secretary of State. But it was funny, because Ella and um, Barbara Canelli and um, Barbara Going Woodhouse used the Secretary mm -hmm. of State as their jumping off point. And that's certainly not to say that they didn't have political careers mm -hmm. before that and then, you know, went past that in some mm -hmm. cases. But And I know there was a, a project that was going on a couple of years ago. People in Italy were looking to do some research about Ella Grasso and her ties to Italy, and they yes. came to the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame to find out more about her. Well, it's the wonderful thing about having a website, and um, I encourage everyone to go on our website and, and visit us at cwhf.org. But um, we do now not just reach Connecticut um, citizens, but national and international women doing research. So it's so wonderful to be able to share these stories around the world, because that's really what women have been doing for years. Kelly, I wonder um, how many other young women are getting involved in politics, maybe not at the age of seven, um, <laughs> but do you see a lot of your classmates, you know, former classmates, were they interested in politics? either on the level of just being interested in the issues or on the level of wanting to have a, a, a career in public service? From my experience, I haven't found um, many of my own classmates. Like, Luckily, I've been involved. I'm a Democrat, and I was involved in the Young Democrats in the state. And mm -hmm. so there are a lot of women who are now holding leadership positions who are you know, young Democrats, mm -hmm. which is really exciting. But I do think it's almost um, a generational thing that my generation has not yet owned the fact of you know, this idea of giving back and getting involved at that level in terms of the community. And there's so much resistance to getting involved in politics. I think that we've seen it so much, you know, such a drastic turn since 2008. So many people were excited about, you know, the Obama wave and then that really um, very negative, very tangible effect that we've seen since that time of people just being so against getting involved in politics. And I think you see it especially um, as a woman. You know, women are like, oh, I don't want to get involved in that. And I really have not seen many others, at least in, in my town and really um, surrounding areas where young people are getting involved at this point. Gail, I wonder about um, the idea that somebody like Olympia Snow, mm -hmm. who's a seasoned politician and who's been uh, really a leader on so many issues, stepping down because she can't find the middle ground anymore, whether that discourages other people, women and men, from even wanting to consider running. Absolutely. I, you know, 
I am a Democrat, but even so, I found it incredibly discouraging that she stepped down. Um, number one, because forgetting about the fact that she's a woman, but she, here was someone who really tried to be a centrist mm -hmm. and really tried to get along with both parties. And she's essentially saying, you know what, we can't get along here. I've, I'm done. I've had enough. And I think that that sends, well, I understand why she has to do it personally. I think it sends a bad message to other people who may want to try, because I think that it is important that we reach out across the aisles and that we do try to find that compromise, because that's the only way government will work, without a doubt. Uh, there was an interesting article in the New York Times yesterday that spoke about how GOP women are getting really frustrated about the tone of the campaign and how so much is based on women's contraceptive rights and everything else, and they want to talk about other issues that impact them. Uh, such as jobs and the economy. And the response from, from a woman at the Republican National Committee was, yes, we're going to start talking about real economic issues that women are concerned about, kitchen table issues like the price of milk. And I thought to myself, huh? <laughs> Is that what they think women care about? So it's so important that women get elected so that we can represent ourselves mm -hmm. and show that we are so much more multidimensional than just the issues of, of milk and gas, but really we have a, a sense of, of real world issues that are out there as well. So I think it's important that you know, we do keep our numbers up. Um, in first selectmen and mayors in Connecticut, there are 169 municipalities, there are only 30 women. Mm -hmm. That says that we're not being well represented. So when people like Olympia Snow step down, you know, we've lost one person who's representing us. Patty, uh, as you're nurturing new politicians, um, women coming through the school who now want to get involved and want to run, do they bring up that issue of the incivility and the partisanship in politics? And is there a way, starting with these new uh, leaders, is there a way to try to change that? Or are we just going to continue to spiral down on this? Well, I certainly believe that our school provides a role model for that. I think that uh, we kind of have our rules for the week mm -hmm. and we pretty much say, look, you know, we all come from different perspectives, from different places, and uh, we just want to be respectful. It's important that everyone be heard. Um, and so we kind of lay the groundwork mm -hmm. there and I am hopeful that they you know, internalize that and again, pay it forward and share it, you know, back in their individual communities. Um, it's tough. It's very tough. You see, you know, to Gail's point, you see what's happening in Congress. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing is happening in Congress. And we have such critical issues facing our country and nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. We have people who are hurting. We all have stories and nothing is happening. So who are the losers? The American people yeah. and the world, yeah. quite frankly. One of the things that the state legislators have been saying is that because nothing is happening in Congress, the legislature has to step up on more issues and has to be involved in things it otherwise might not have because at a state level, you can get something done. Right. And it's sort of changing the framework of state government as well. Uh, we started a little late, so we have a few extra minutes. If there's anyone in the audience who has a question they'd like to ask any of our panelists or a point they'd like to make, I'd be happy to have you uh, speak up if you just want to. Yes. Ask about the uh, elephant in the room, and that is money. 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 Uh, what about I, it? <laughs> I personally am a little bit tired of people purchasing offices, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the fact that you all pay, are paying or have paid your dues. Um, I think experience is critical, but it really concerns me that. Well, I'd love to run for office. I don't have money to do that. And, well, Patty, that's one of the and I'm an independent, which is, of course is the other. Patty, area. that's one of the issues that you uh, teach almost yeah, every we, year. Look, we spent almost a day and a half just on fundraising. Years ago, um, I was at a, a, a uh, event in, in D.C. and Barbara Mikulski was speaking and those of you who know Barbara Mikulski knows you can hear a pin drop when she speaks. No one dare speak. And she was talking about the challenges she faced when she ran from when she was trying to, to go from Congress to Senate 
And of course, in Maryland, there were a million you know, men that were interested in running for the United States Senate. And those of you who know Barbara Mikulski, she's you know, this big, and she was just like, I'm running, I'm running. And they kept dissing her, saying, well, you can nev you'll never be able to raise the money. Oh, I'm going to raise the money, and I will raise the money. So basically, she went to women's living rooms and said, ladies, I need to total yourselves up. The Ferragamo shoes, the Chanel suit. I'm not, I'm not even going to talk about the estate jewelry you're currently wearing. <laughs> I need a check. And, you know, that is the other issue. And Gloria Steinem says often that we just haven't had our own power long enough. And so as a result of that, when you traditionally go and ask a woman for a contribution, you get a $25 check. And you go to a man and you get a $2,500 check. So again, part of the um, part of the process and part of the training at the school is how to how to effectively fundraise for yourself. We can fundraise bake sales. We can do great things for our our church, our synagogue, our kids. But when it comes to totaling ourselves up and asking people, I invite you to be a partner in this campaign, um, and you know to 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 make things better in our community. Often women are very reluctant to do that. I, I hope that you found that helpful in terms of the fundraising. I think the fundraising piece of the campaign school, I have a background as a uh, finance director for Congressman Larson, and I'm now doing nonprofit fundraising. But one of the things that uh, we talk about in the school is um, in terms of fundraising, like spheres of influence. So you start most immediately with your friends, your family, you know, just picking up the phone, making those calls, and then you find the people who share the same kind of ideals that you do. And then you go, you extend the circle and you find the people who have an ax to grind with those who, um, who you're running against. And so you find, you know, you end up, like if you, if you partition it down, you'll find, first of all, you'll be amazed at how many people will be so incredibly generous. And then on the flip side, you'll be amazed at some people that you would expect to be incredibly <laughs> generous aren't always generous. But, you know, it's just being able to ask. And I think that you're really empowered from the campaign school to make that kind of ask and be willing to pick up the phone and actually ask for money. And, you know, the return ends up being really, really great if you own it. And it's one of the greatest things that I learned from the campaign school that day and a half of finance training. And you can see that fundraising can be, I mean, you, you need money to, to, to run an effective campaign. That's just the bottom line. It's just varying degrees of how much you need depending upon what you're running for. But you look at some of the uh, members of Congress or aspiring members of Congress who are self-financed. It doesn't, it's not necessarily the path to victory. Uh, it's, you know, you know, oftentimes you'll think, wow, I don't have to worry about fundraising. I'm just going to write myself a $50 million check. And, you know, that, that, that's a downer for some people. Some people are really turned off by that. The whole Citizens United wave, I think it's just cutting in a very different way in that people are starting to wake up in this country. You know, a women, especially the war on women, what Gail was just talking about, uh, women are starting to rise up. Women are starting to find their voices again and saying no. And I think that's, that's, that's a good thing for our country. Patty, we've only had one cycle so far, but is there any way to tell yet, and maybe we won't know till the, this next election cycle, how much the public financing in Connecticut affected legislative races, whether no. more women might have gotten in because they knew they could raise a certain amount and then it would be matched? Is it too soon for that's, us to really know? It's a little know? too soon. Yeah. It's a little too soon to, to determine that. Is that something that would, it, it would interest you as a person that might run, Kelly, that might run for a, a state position? Would I'm you? in a little bit of a unique situation because my husband's a current uh, state representative and he uh, just ran the first time under yeah. the Citizens Election Program. And, so it's, it's a great equalizer. Um, he had to raise $5,000, and then he was given the state grant. So instead of concentrating on you know, that kind of money game and constantly fundraising, he was out there going door to door, hearing the concerns of his constituents, which I believe has made him a better legislator. And it's also leveled that playing field. So, And I know that there's accommodations for you know, um, third party candidates, like independents, and, mm -hmm. and I'm not excuse me, for familiar with the specifics of that, but it was intended to level that playing field. So I think you are seeing people who might otherwise have kind of shied away from that money raising end of it now getting involved because $5,000 
and 100 small contributions from your district is much more palatable for like a state representative race. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you have a background in fundraising, not necessarily mm -hmm. for political campaigns, mm -hmm. but for a number of other things. And one thing that always has struck me when I've heard Patty uh, talk about fundraising, and I suspect that maybe you have done this too, is that what you're really doing when you're calling to ask someone for money is you're not asking them, can you give this to me? You're saying, I have an opportunity for you. Isn't that how you do it? I suppose it is. I mean, I guess all of my, I mean, I would find it very hard to fundraise if I wasn't really passionate mm -hmm. about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's not give it to me, it's give it to the cause, yeah. quite honestly. So I think as a candidate, you, you know, put out there what you believe in, mm -hmm. which is, I think, what you were saying. I don't think there's anything more powerful than just stating exactly mm -hmm. what you believe in mm -hmm. and asking people to support that. Mm -hmm and giving them the opportunity to be part of it. I like the way yeah. Patty has taught me to do that. the language. Yeah. Do we have any other questions uh, from the audience? Yes. I just want to say thank you for doing this today. My question is, given all the polarization we're seeing and the fact that there's so much inability to move forward, do you think that there's going to come a time where we're going to have to create a new system? Uh, you know, this Democrat and Republican thing seems to be so stuck in some ways. People are getting so polarized. Is there any room for leadership um, mm -hmm. among women to create a new kind of format for how we create uh, political movement or community betterment or whatever? I know that's a big question, but, um, you know, do you think that the, the current party system is going to work? You think we're going to get past this? these moments of polarization, or uh, is it here to stay? My own opinion on that, and then I'll let the, uh, the panel take it, is that I think the parties are starting to burn themselves out <laughs> and make themselves less important, because I think people are so disgusted uh, about the impasses that we see all around us that I think people are looking for an alternative. So instead of saying, boy, I don't like those Democrats, I'm really going to become a, a, a Republican, they look at the Republicans and they say, well, they're not helping move forward either, so now what do I do? Um, and I'm thinking that the party system is going is starting to break down. As a, if, if all you do every election season is rile up your base, what about all the rest of those people? What do you think? Well, just as an example, you look at a Republican debates. Uh, fortunately, on the Democratic side, we're sitting it out. We don't have a debate. I'm really enjoying it. I know it's probably not going to happen again in my lifetime, so I'm really taking it in. I find these Republican debates inspiring. I really do. It's like, really? This is the best that this party can, 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 can share? Isn't there a fact, you know, and again, I think of Olympia Snow. And that's what I think. I'm hoping women are thinking like me and saying, wow, I can do this. Or even last time, when Dennis Kucinich was running, really? Is this what, we, I mean, if he has the hubris to run, where are women who say, yeah, I, I, I want in. I could, I, you know, I, I want a shot at this as well. I think it's, I think you're going to see the right, the, uh, the Republicans are in the stranglehold with the Tea Party. You see everybody's limboing to the right. I mean, they're, they're falling off the edge. So right. Newt Gingrich a couple of weeks ago called uh, Mitt the M word, a moderate. It was like, wow, you know, his numbers plummeted. Uh, on the Democratic side, we've got the stranglehold of the left wing, not so, so left. But the fact of the matter is, I think who's going to make the difference? I think we're going to see a group of women saying, okay, guys, we've given you this time. You had your chance. You've really screwed it up. Let us clean it up. I think you're going to see a coalition of women, Democratic and Republican women, rising up and saving our country. I, I do. You heard it here first. <laughs> I liked it. I, like I, I know. I like it. Do you like it? I like it. I, I do think that women are much better at getting over themselves and really trying to look for how we can find compromise and come to some sense of agreement. And I see it in what I do every day where I work very closely with a lot of Republican women. One of them is my senator, Tony Boucher, uh, who is a Republican. And I come to her all the time with, uh, with issues that we're together on and that we feel we can make a difference if we join forces and work together on. And that's really what you have to keep in mind. And I think women are much better at that, at saying, OK, what is our ultimate goal here? How can we get there? If we have to compromise, that's OK. We're willing to do that as long as we can move an issue forward. And so we just have to encourage more women to step up and, you know, on both sides of the aisle and work together to that end. 
This is why West End is so well run. <laughs> <laughs> we have Oh, I'm sorry, Kelly. Uh, no, just one of the things that I think we should look at too is mim mimicking other countries who have, instead of like a minority party representation, have a minority representation for women. Like India has 30% of their parliament seats are reserved for women. And so why is it that we have, like in our town, we have minority party representation, but it's such a small slice of the town that is being represented, and we only have of, um, our 18 elected officials. Um, there's one on our board of directors, which is our like head body of government, and then there's five on the board of education, which is, I think it's probably fair to say, typically more women are interested in that. But one thing I think as women we need to do is instead of trying to cut each other down, we need to build each other up, and we need to get behind women candidates and encourage those to run and be like, hey, you need a babysitter while you're doing X, Y, and Z. You know, as that we have so many roles, like you know, I have a full-time job from nine to five. Then I come home and I work second shift mm -hmm. as a wife and a caretaker and a homemaker, and then I'm on the board of education. And so it's something that our male counterparts aren't going to have to deal with. And so we really need to rally together and, you know, be that kind of change to allow for these things to happen moving forward. Catherine, that's one of the things that I always feel when I leave the uh, Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame dinner every year is that all of the people that are in the room, and there are men and women, is that they're all walking out the door with a sense of, I supported this person so that she could do this, or, you know, she helped me so that I could be here. It's women helping women, truly. And, um, you know, I think about when we, I see this void of women in politics very much the same way I feel about the void in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's an equal problem that we need to be really concerned about. And when we inducted Anne Mulcahy into the hall two years ago, and we were interviewing her for her tribute film, Sometimes when women get to that level, you think, well, maybe they just had it easy. Maybe it, it, you know, they're not fully aware of what it's like for the average woman. And when I heard her sit there and say, here's the deal. If women don't work every day to help another woman, to reach back and bring another woman along, it will never happen. We will never move forward. It has to be a conscious effort every day. And I think that's that's really what we're talking about, and that's hopefully what the campaign school, as you said, um, is to promoting. You, Catherine, when yeah. is your inductance, uh, induction oh, ceremony? Induction and ceremony. who might you be honoring and in oh, inducting I'm this so year? I'm so glad you asked. You're welcome. Um, October the 18th in Hartford at the Convention Center. Our mm -hmm. theme this year is Women's Perspective, Celebrating Voice and Vision. Um, and we're inducting the internationally renowned Annie Leibovitz, photographer, oh, um, Ann Gerrels, uh, the 23-year senior foreign correspondent, and our own Faith Middleton, 30 years of the hosting the Faith Middleton show and a thought-provoking broadcaster. So we're very excited. And certainly, it's and one of the reasons we picked this theme is it's so important to hear women's voice, because mm -hmm. we've been silenced for a very long time. I have time for one more question. Yes, Bessie. I just want to follow up what you were saying. I was an opinion columnist for the Hypergrant for nine years. And usually I will get very nice letters from women saying, I don't agree with you. I would get letters from men saying, you are a stupid liberal woman. And I think that opinion writing is something that women have not been doing. If you look at who gets published, it's usually men. The letters are written by men. And this would be a very simple way for all of us to really have our voices heard and even get paid for it. Mm -hmm. So as someone who was very frustrated for nine years not hearing from women, I really want to encourage you, as part of the political process, to think about doing that. Every time you see an issue that you don't agree with, write to the newspapers. That's my bit. Thank you. Yes. I think I'll give each of you a chance to uh, just say a final word before we wrap up. And Patty, I'd like to start with you. Well, it's been so fun celebrating our month with all of you. I really have enjoyed it. What are we going to do for again. the other 11 months? I, I don't know. Well, I celebrate, you know, I act as if every month is Women's Month. And Teresa will tell you that. She'll bail me out here. I do. Because women are fabulous. We have so much to offer, so much to give and share. And so I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity to come to the campaign school, uh, to get online and apply, and um, to, to help to make a difference in our world. Thank you so much. Gail? 
I think that it's very important that we have equal representation. And I think you need to consider that when you vote, when you decide what you're going to do, who you're going to support. Because ultimately, when you look at the numbers out there, we're not well represented, which means that your voice is being muted in the process. So I went to the Women's Campaign School. I thought it was important to pay it forward. I wrote recommendations the following year for two women, one a fellow Democrat and one a Republican. And I brought that Republican with me to the legislative office building last week to teach her how to testify in favor of a bill that we were both supporting. Because it's important to not only take that opportunity to say, OK, here you go, done, but really to mentor that woman and to bring that next generation up to think that it's important and that we have the skill sets to really make a difference in people's lives. Catherine? You know what, I'd like to address the lady who mentioned the problem with raising money. I think we all can come up with a number of reasons why it's difficult for women to think about getting out there. Um, I'd like to encourage you to go look at the exhibit in the back rooms because what that does is talk about the struggles and the accomplishments that women have had. And they're all inspiring stories. So either visit the, uh, um, the exhibit in the back mm -hmm. or go on our website and read about these really powerful stories. Um, and I think you will find just extraordinary odds that these women overcome. So mm -hmm. I think the, the word is that we can overcome and, and find ourselves equal. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Kelly, you have the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's been so great to be here today and to be in a room of such wonderful women and a few good men who have joined us. Um, I think that if you have the opportunity to go to the Women's Campaign School, if you have any remote interest in politics, I would highly encourage you to do it. Even if you're not that interested in politics, but you're interested in the system, to just go and be surrounded by you know, 50 to 60 really amazing women who come from so many different walks of life life and see that you know you can do it and feel that the F word, meaning feminism, is not something to shy away from and it's something to really own. It's about you being able to do whatever it is that you want. It doesn't have to be a man-hating, bra-burning type of institution, which I think is a part of perception. So definitely check it out and I hope to get back this summer for a day. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us and for celebrating Women's History Month. Hi, I'm Sally. I'm the director of the Old State House. I'd like to thank you all for coming and encourage you to see the exhibit across the hall, to fill out your surveys, and just to let you know, we have a number of great programs coming up next month, one on history of transportation and current issues involving transportation excuse me, transportation in Connecticut. Um, and in June, um, Governor Lowell Weicker will be here in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Diane Smith. And we also have concerts planned for the summer and all kinds of things, including our farmer's market again this year. So we hope to see you next month and into the summer and beyond. Thank you.